Hello and welcome everyone. And uh, I'd just like to say first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers who've worked so hard with me this year. And um, those who, my team, my personal team at the organization and also our advisors. Uh, this is like another family reunion for us. It's uh, three years now, and we're just so excited that it's going, and we just hope and pray that it continues on. Uh, this is a very, very special event for us, and we think that what we're about to do now is something that makes it unique. Uh, it's always been important for us to recognize the scholarship in the area of uh, black Germans and black German studies, but equally, if not more important to us, who identify as black Germans is for us to tell our own stories. So I think it's very important that we begin and end our convention, which this is why we call it a convention, because for us it's a family reunion, we're sharing our stories, and it's not just, but as important as an academic conference that uh, we can do all of this together. So. I just thank everyone who's here. Um, it's wonderful to see the faces that I know and that know me, and uh, great to see new faces, and hope we'll see you all again in the coming years. So if my first panel, which will be Life Stories, would join me on the stage, perhaps. Uh, in, for time-saving purposes, I'll allow you to read their personal bios in the program, and I'll just let you know who they are, or we'll see here, and I'll turn it over to them, and uh, you'll hear from me again when they're done, perhaps to allow you to ask them a few questions. So we welcome to the stage now Ruth Spencer, Anna Hawthorne, and Lita Littles Wimbley. Thank you again. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank the uh, Black German Heritage and Research Association for the opportunity to present my experience. Particularly, I appreciate the support of Rosemary Pena, who has always supported uh, the, the expression of Black Germans in the United States as well as abroad. I also want to thank my friend Peggy Pisha and Carolyn Wilkins both who made this, my visit to Germany possible. I'm a very private person, so I'm going to read this as opposed to the way I usually give presentations and hope it won't be too boring. Um, my only motivation for speaking here is to encourage my listeners to explore their own heritage of unknowns and experience the visceral task of facing the puzzle of their own lives. In, it is this experience that has given voice to all of my identities, African American, lesbian, feminist, and born a black German. What does being a black German mean to me? The German part of me was always a discussion between me and me, all in my head. My parents almost never talked about my existence in Germany, other than to say that I lived in an orphanage until I came to the US. My mother was German and white, and my father was a black GI. The tone and brevity of the conversation made it clear to me that they really didn't want to talk about it. They told me that they loved me and they were my only family that I needed. Since they were the only family I had or had ever known, it was easy to accept rather than face the unknown black hole of a history that always felt full of pain and rejection when I thought, uh, thought about it as a child or adolescence. My earliest memories were of a Lutheran orphanage in the small bucolic picturesque town of Nundetelstown in the Bavarian region of Germany. I lived in an orphanage from the age of one until the time I was adopted, approximately five. My life in the orphanage was very regimented. We had a strict routine of meals, exercise, and sleep. And as I was one of the shortest kids there, the real challenge was just climbing the steps up and down to go to my dorm room every day. I was one of only two black kids there the other was a black boy a couple of years older than I that I always wanted to be around. I don't know if it was because I, he was black and I was black, or maybe it was because I liked him 
Or maybe it's just because he was one of the few people that really paid attention to my existence. So thus I always wanted to be around him. When he decided to run away, I insisted that he take me with him. We made the great escape. But of course, we didn't think about the reality that two black kids on the streets of a small German town would stand out and be spotted faster than the New York Minute. One day soon afterwards, though, he left the orphanage. I don't know what happened to him. All I know that I was extremely sad and that I've never forgotten him. I remember being told that I was going to go to this nice family and they would be my parents. The problem is that I had no concept of the word family and parents, since I had never had any. I'm told I spoke pretty good German for my age, although I knew no English. Later, I would learn from my parents that there, were six, there was a six month delay in my coming to the States because I had to have surgery. I had rickets, and the US government would not allow children to be adopted that had deformities. To be sure that there were no barriers in, in my being admitted, my parents arranged to have my legs set as corrective surgery while in Germany before I left. When it was time to go, the woman who had worked for the German government and acted as an agent for my parents put me on a plane with a luggage tag on my coat button that said 2WC and Luetta Spencer from Rosemary Hanfest. I arrived in New York City with only two possessions, one small suitcase which contained a few outfits of hand-me-downs. And the second item was a small brown teddy bear that my parents sent to me in advance to keep me company on the plane. It would be my best friend, forever companion, and affirmed the existence of a life that I had left behind and that would be my resilience for the future. By the time I entered the first grade at six, Thanks to my parents' diligence and a great kindergarten teacher, I had a good vocabulary and could read on a third grade level. My parents were both teachers and books were everywhere in my house. Not being talented like my older sister, my parents encouraged me my love of books. I fell in love with them as a way to gain their approval and a way to keep from thinking about myself. I thought if I read enough, I would know how to think, what to think, and would not have to listen to my own thoughts. Although my parents encouraged the reading, they also demanded a controlled decorum at home as well as public. In the South, in the late 50s and 60s, expressions of anger would lead to the death of black people. In my town, black people were often portrayed by whites as out of control and dangerous. <coughs> Unlike whites, blacks were always identified by race in the newspaper or television or radio if there were any alleged violations of the law. I never forgot my first episode of unleashed anger. My sister and I had attended a white elementary school because the city forgot to include our little street in their, white, in their uh, zoning of segregated housing map that required uh, black children to go to black schools. Uh, so in our school, there were six to 10 black kids in an elementary school of about 100. I was in the second grade playing hide and seek. During rest, uh, recess, a white kid yelled to the other kids, that SS half-breed is hiding behind the big tree. I knew exactly what he meant and became enraged. Although he was six inches taller than I, 15 pounds heavier, I ran up to him and I broke his nose. <laughs> I threatened to kill him if he ever told anyone about it. I was so angry, I felt no fear, but that didn't last long. Then I realized I should be scared to death. When I realized I, what I had done, I quickly internalized the, the ang that anger was a dangerous emotion, and that is the only time in my life I've ever physically assaulted anybody. My sister and I lived in an idyllic childhood with loving parents, a caring extended family community support, and a very middle to upper class standard of living for black America. My sister Krista had lived with her uh, mother and grandmother in Nordberg prior to being adopted by my parents. She would develop into a social star, the queen of her high school prom, as well as Miss Con Congeniality in the local AKA debutante cotillion. My parents would undertake an one more adoption of my sister Willa at the age of nine. Willa had lived with her mother on the outskirts of Nuremberg. Once again, cultural immersion was a methodology of choice introducing Willa to her new home. Willis spoke a little English but quickly and quickly integrated into the neighborhood. 
A couple of months after my sister was here, she said, asked the question, when am I going home? My response to her was, what do you mean going home? Uh, you're here, you're gonna be adopted just like Krista and I. When she really realized that that was the case, she cried all night long. Um, I'm not sure that it didn't take her a number of years before she really comprehended that this was gonna be her family. Years later, I would find out that her mother told her that she was going to come to the United States to visit relatives. So she had no idea that she was never gonna go back home again. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that by virtue of the fact that I lived in an orphanage rather than uh, living in homes like my sister's, that the ad whole adoption process was much easier for me. And although most people would say that was a bad thing, I, I think it's something we should really rethink. My parents chose to adopt because they couldn't have children of their own. Many of my mother's nieces and nephews and family grew up in my parents' home. Um, Once that those family members had rotated through my parents' home, my mother decided to respond to the campaign mounted through Ebony Magazine and many of the regional black newspapers of the day, which admonished the black community, especially the black middle class, to respond to the plight of black German children left as part of the consequences of the occupation of World War II. These arrangements were perfect for my parents because they were too old to adopt uh, through any U.S. agency, and yet they were model candidates by German gui guidelines. They were both very well educated, had graduate degrees from NYU and Columbia, respectively, uh, because at that time, West Virginia would pay the tuition at these schools rather than have black people sit in a classroom with white people. Um, they were professionally successful, financially stable, and intricately connected to both black and white worlds. My parents saw themselves as part of the W.E. Du Bois Talented Tenth and felt seriously responsible to their family, community, and their race. Their network of friends included many black intellectual leaders of the day who were just their friends when they came to our house for dinner. And between uh, my mother and my Aunt Ruth, uh, there was constant discussion about the trials and tribulations of successful black classical musicians as both of them were graduates of the Juilliard School of Music. The, black, the rich bourgeoisie environment there came, became trade-offs for behavioral expectations and demands of social class. We were always reminded that we, are, we were the children of W.C. and Louetta Spencer. And part of that uh, reminding point was that we would had to be the poster child that had proof that adoption works. Uh, my parents never talked about the cost of adoptions I know that there were elaborate financial transactions for my sister, since these were direct financial transactions with money going to their families rather than to the state, which was the case when you adopted uh, through an orphanage the way um, I was. They never talked about how much it would cost for the corrective surgery, but I hope the German government gave them a discount since they wanted to unload a lot of ger black German kids. Um, when I was 35 years old, my father gave me a copy of the file on my adoption. There wasn't much of anything in it. As a matter of fact, the only significant thing in the file was my name, Gudrun Isoldi Fritz, my mother's name, Erica Erna Fritz, and my birthday. It was like reading about someone else, someone I should know, but someone I had no idea how to know. Fast forward, 1980. I'm in Frankfurt, Germany with a black female friend of mine. We're, in a multi we're on a multicultural tour tri of Europe, trip of Europe and decide to take a side trip to Frankfurt. We're waiting for lunch in a restaurant. Neither of us speak German, but we had not had any trouble maneuvering through the town before then. We go to the restaurant and a white man comes to our booth and starts gesturing, speaking in German. We kind of motion to him that we really don't want to talk to him and finally uh, we get the waiter to come over and explain that we didn't want to talk to him. He was obviously drunk. We asked the waiter to tell him that we're tourists and didn't want to talk. He tells, the wait he tells the waiter to tell us that the only black women in Germany are prostitutes and he's simply offering us business. And what were we upset about? We immediately left that restaurant, ran to the nearest train station and hopped the train out of Germany. 
I vowed never to come back unless I could come back on terms that were not so subjective to the vicissitudes of being black in Germany. Although my closest friends knew I was born, adopted and born in Germany, all others were told that I was from West Virginia. In that black hole of my psyche was only my name, my birth date, and my teddy bear. I wanted to know more about myself, but I also wanted to know too about those who stayed in Germany. What were their lives like? What would, what would my life have been like if I'd stayed? Um, do they wish they had been adopted? Who got the best deal? And what's more, um, any other things that would tell me more about myself? Um, I would discover later, as a family therapist working with many adoptees, that black families in the United States had to pass a color test. The question was, could these children, if you adopted them, look like your own children? Fortunately, with my parents, it worked. My mother was chocolate complexion, while my father was much lighter. But he was often mistaken for an Italian uh, when, he, when he lived in New York, New York City and traveled to the East. What I don't understand, with a name like Spencer, how do you mistake people as Italian? <laughs> Not understand. Um, my stomach would go into knots when white people asked me if I was really black after I told them I was, and they asked me the question again. But fortunately, black folks always knew I was black. And that wasn't a problem. That was great, except that they always commented about my long, straight hair. At that time, my mother refused to allow me to ever cut it, and it was the bane of my existence. Fast forward again to 2007, when I met Peggy Pisha, a visiting professor at Vassar College. Another friend had told me of her presence, so I went to the new employee uh, orientation as a way to meet her. I'd already been there for two years and never been to the orientation. <laughs> um, Peggy had already been briefed about my history, and so when she met me and excitedly responded to the greeting saying, you must be the black German Diane told me about. That was the beginning of our friendship in which she would take me to my journey uh, to find the answers of my past and, and black Germany's present. It was my friend Carolyn Wilkins, who was right there, who told me that I had to go and that when the opportunity arrives, she saw to it that I was able to go. In 2008, Peggy took me back to the very orphanage run by the uh, Daikini Order that I spent my early childhood in. I'm reminded that this is a place that I first fell in love with trees. I saw the giant 10-foot metal, door, metal doors to the building that looked so familiar. Oh, and those steps again? This time I had no trouble running up and down them. I was given a copy of the ledger in the orphanage when I arrived, having spent the first year of my life in a hospital. Peggy took me to the social work supervisor who carefully explained to me the information in my file. She was very glad that I had come back to find out more about myself because she said that was rare for black adoptees in her experience. She told me that the character report said that I had no favorite dishes, was not scared of people or animals, responded to the orphanage's home, sometimes a little shy and a little slow. Good thing I never knew that. <laughs> she read every page to me. The one fact that I had never known and would not see anywhere else was the name of my father, Edward Lewis, a sergeant in the army. I asked why it was never in any other document, and her reply was that my German mother provided this information because she knew it would never be revealed outside of that report. I would find out that my German mother was 27 years old and a shoe salesperson when I was born. From this visit, I would learn, too, that Germany had a law that any black children born to unwed mothers could immediately become the wards of the state. The document stated that the reason I was given up to be adopted, because I'm black. Peggy took me to meet several Afro-Germans, and I spent hours talking to Rita Cheatham and Judy, early activists in the Adifa movement. I also met women who spent time in orphanages similar to mine, and we would share comparisons of what life was like for those who stayed versus those who left. Peggy also took me to the Bundeswaffen, the annual gathering of Afro-Germans to see and hear about the broad spectrum of lives of Afro-Germans today. While there, I met Germans who maneuvered the German society, scholars, actors, writers, poets, doctors, and others. I heard their stories and found we shared the common experience of being minorities in a racist society. Attending the Bundeswehr gave me a profound internal emotional experience of being connected 
to a part of the black diaspora that's a part of me. I know that every time I come to this conference, I will meet this conference and those conferences, I will meet people in which our, our worlds will intersect either by history or by reflections of our current lives. They tell me what could have happened to me if I'd stayed and I can tell them what, would have what might have happened if they left. I no longer have a conversation just with me about me, about being a black German. Now I'm connected to an entire community of black Germans on both sides of the ocean. This journey has allowed me to illuminate my black hole and to reconcile the many facets of my past and present. I finally caught up with my life. I want to celebrate today my connection of being a black German and thank you for the company of your presence. And I want to introduce you to one person I brought to. That is my teddy bear. <laughs> afternoon. She's going to make me cry before I get started. I'm a big cry baby. <laughs> My name is Anna Hawthorne and first giving honor to God and then I would like to say thank you to Carmen Geschke and Rosa, Rosa Marie. Yes, for inviting me. I uh, really appreciate it and look forward to the opportunity to share my story with each of you. Never in my life would I have thought that there is such an organization as Black Germans. But uh, one day, not too long ago, I was at a church function, and I sat next to a Black German. Little did I know. We began conversation and got all excited, and that person was Carmen Geschke. And we began to talk, and she shared with me about this organization, and I am really excited to be in your presence. So I would like to share my story with you. My story is about me and my father. I grew up um, in a little town called Sandhofen in Mannheim, Germany. I um, was born in the 60s when it wasn't so popular to have children, number one, out of wedlock, and even worse, by a black man. My mother's uh, family, they uh, were very upset with her when they found out that not only was she pregnant, but she was not married and she was pregnant by a black man. So after my birth, they put her out. They didn't want anything to do with her. And so she had a very hard life. She um, ended up with child after child after child. And none of us knew our biological father. So my dream was always to know my biological father. I always wanted to know him. I just, I would see the other kids in school and they had both their parents and there was just always something missing. Not only that, um, but a lot of times, a lot of the kids that I went to school with, I wasn't able to really uh, interact with them too much because when their parents found out that I was black they were often told they couldn't um, be part of my presence or they couldn't come to my house or I couldn't come to their house anymore so those types of things were hard so I had a hard time with being black and later on uh, as I got a little bit older my grandmother did accept me but she did not accept my sisters and brothers, uh, or brother. Uh, she accepted me and she allowed me to come, but she didn't want anything to do with the rest of them. And so as a little child, she would tell me, I'm not black. I'm not like them black people, I'm, I'm different. So of course, I, as I grew up, I had a little bit of a complex because if somebody called me nigger, I was very hurt and upset. And that happened a lot in those days, uh, especially in school. So needless to say, I had a complex about who I was. Um, I wasn't comfortable in an all-white setting, 
and I wasn't comfortable in an all black setting. Um, I always felt uncomfortable and I always felt I had to prove something. So um, growing up as the oldest in the household uh, and my mama being a single mother, she had to work sometimes two and three jobs. So I took care of my sisters and my brother and many times uh, had to go to school and fight uh, and just had to do what you had to do because uh, if somebody messed with my sisters or with my brother, then they messed with me. So <laughs> that's the way it was. So, but we grew up, we had a mother who worked hard and always told us that no matter what, whatever, you know, you don't have to have a lot, but whatever you have, take care of it. She always told us if you work, you're going to get paid and you're going to earn your way. So all of us, all of us made something out of ourselves. None of us just, you know, um, disappointed our mother. Um, very uh, grateful for my mother. She is by far the best. I always tell her she is the best. Uh, because my mother, uh, even though she had a very hard life, she always was a positive person. And I believe that that helped all of us. Uh, it was four of us at home. One of us was given up for adoption. Uh, and the reason she was given up for adoption was because when she was born, she was sick. And my mother not having a place to stay at the time when she was born, which is the sister after me, um, she was talked into letting her go. It was told to her, well, you can't afford the hospital bills. You can't afford to take care of her. You just need to let her go. And so with the understanding that when she turned 18, they would tell her the truth and give her the choice of meeting us and um, my mother, uh, my mom let her go. Uh, and every Christmas, every holiday, every birthday, we would see our mother just sad on those occasions because she would say, here I am, I raised the four of you, I could have raised Carmen, I could have raised Carmen. So needless to say though, God is good. And with God, all things are possible. Uh, again, my lifelong wish and dream was always to meet my daddy. When I was a little girl, uh, when I did get the opportunity just to sit down and play or, or have time to myself, I would always play mama, daddy, and child. And I would fantasize about one day being with my daddy and my daddy just taking me to the park and, you know, and I could swing like other little kids that I would see, you know, and just little stuff like that was important to me. And that was always just my lifelong dream. And I came to the States when I was um, 17. And I got married and thought, well, maybe now that I'm in the U.S., things might change. You know, I, I married a black man, so I figured, well, it can't be like it was in Germany that there is such a difference now. Little did I know. I come over here and now I'm the red bone. <laughs> or the salt and pepper baby, or, you know, uh, all these different names. So, so here again, I had a hard time identifying with, with who I was. I would be with black folks be uncomfortable. I'd be with all white folks, be uncomfortable. So it was just always, that, just never feeling like you belonged anywhere. But I'm a headstrong person. And I say, well, no matter what they say, no matter I'm going to be who I am. And I tried to find myself. Well, I didn't find myself until 1994 which is when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And when I began to study the Bible and read the Bible and find out about who I'm supposed to be in Christ, that is when I actually began to really accept who I am as a person. Because now I knew who I was in Christ. And that's really all that matters. It doesn't matter what color I am or, or where I came from, all that matters is who I am in Christ. 
So I lived uh, in South Carolina um, since 1977. And in 2006, I get a phone call from my baby sister. And she tells me, you never guess what happened. And I'm like, what, what? And she's just on the phone messing with me. And finally, she's, she says, I found my daddy. I said, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. And she said, no, I found my daddy. And so she shared with me, and we, got, we were all excited and emotional about it. And I was so happy for her because, again, this is something I've always wanted. So I had looked for my father before, even hired a private investigator trying to find him, but just never, never found anything. And then I would go through these phases, you know, one minute I wanted to find him and then the next minute I was mad. Well, why didn't he never try and find me? And so, you know, you just go through these phases and you continue to grow up and life continues to happen. And anyway, my sister shared with me about finding her father and, and um, I told her, I said, wow, maybe one day I'm going to find mine. So she asked me, well, what do you know about him? I said, well, you know, not a whole lot. All I knew was his name. I knew uh, an approximate age, and I knew that he was from Chicago. I gave her that information. She said, well, let me see what I can do. So she used a, a certain kind of program to find people, and I didn't think no more about it, really, after we had the conversation. The very next week, i never forget it, on a Tuesday morning, she calls me. And she says, you never guess who I just talked to. And I, I said, who you talk to? She said, guess, take a guess. And so I'm thinking maybe some more of her father's family members that, you know, maybe she found out she had some more sisters or brothers. She said, I just got through talking to your daddy. And I was like, don't play with me. <laughs> I said, don't blame, are you serious? And she said, yes, ma'am, I just got through talking to your daddy. So I was like, wow. She said, here's the number, you can call him. I hung up that phone so fast and dialed that number. And when he said hello, I couldn't say nothing. I was just on the phone, I said, oh my God. Oh my God, that's all I kept saying. Oh my God, he said, are you gonna stop saying oh my God? <laughs> and I said, I can't believe it. I said, it is really, I'm really talking to my daddy. And he, so we began conversation. And from that point on, we talked every day. And so the next thing was, I, I never seen a picture of him. Never seen what he looked like just by description of my mother. My mother would tell me what he looked like. But I never seen a picture, so I, I wanted a picture now. I wanted to see a picture. So he told me he would send me a picture in the mail. This was, at the, this was the beginning of May in 2006. The picture arrives at my house, and when I'm telling you all, I stayed up all night and looked at that picture. I couldn't sleep. I just kept looking at that picture. It was just so amazing that... Now, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a picture of my dad. And all kinds of emotions went through me, all kinds of thoughts, you know, because some people would say to me, well, aren't you mad? He should have found you. And, and, but I couldn't be mad. All I could think about was this was a lifelong dream of mine. Why should I waste time being mad? God opened that door for me. And will I now not walk through that door? There was no way. So on May, let's see, it was Memorial Day. Memorial Day uh, 2006, I planned to go to Chicago to meet him in person. Uh, me and my husband talked about it, and we began to make the plans and everything. And we are again at a, at a church function. And one of my husband's cousin, she lived in Chicago. And little did we know, as we began conversating with her, he told her that we were coming to Chicago. And she said, well, where are you all going? And we told him that my father lived in Blue Island, and that's where we would go. 
She said, you won't believe this, but I'm about 20 minutes from there. You guys can just come and stay with me, and I'll take you where you need to go. So God just put everything in place. I mean, he fixed it even down to where we had a car, we had a place to stay, we had, everything was just in place. So the day I get to Chicago, uh, we go to my husband's cousin's house first, and I'm sitting there on pins and needles because I'm ready to go, I'm ready to meet this man in person. Uh, We finally get there and ring the doorbell, and there he was, and I was like, couldn't say nothing. I just stood there. He grabbed me, hugged me. We came in the house. We sat there for, we didn't sit there too long, for maybe 10 minutes. And he asked my husband, could he be excused with me for just a little bit? And my husband said, yeah, sure. So he grabs his hat and he says, "Uh, come on, baby girl. And we leave. We're in the car driving, and I, I, I didn't even know how to conversate at this point because I was so nervous and so emotional, I didn't know what to say. So I'm thinking, okay, where are we going? He takes me to the park, and here I was. My dream was coming alive. He grabs my hand, and we are walking through the park, and I was just the whole time thinking, I am walking through the park with my daddy. That is just unbelievable. And you know, as we conversated and got to know each other, um, there is little stuff that I found out, you know, little things that I do and always wondered about. One thing I always wondered about was I did not grow up in the church. Uh, We grew up in the city. I mean, my mama would, you know, my mama believed in God, but we didn't. I mean, we just didn't grow up in the church. But I always wondered why I had such an interest in God and in the church. And, and, you know, just always was something I loved to talk about. It was always something I wanted to be a part of. And after I got saved, I, you know, grew in the church. And then finally, I'm now an associate minister at my church. I was a Sunday school teacher. Just always involved in the church. I love the church. And come to find out, that's what my daddy does. You know, he is, a, he is a deacon in the church. He's a Sunday school teacher. He is a musician in the church. So uh, I guess that's where all that came from. And we always tease. We say, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, even though this one was about 3,000 miles away. But, it's <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was something that only God can do. And I just... Thank God for it every day. I seize every moment, and I thank God for it. We talk every day, two, three times a day, and we see each other a couple of times a year. I mean, and not only did God bless me with my father, but he gave me a whole extended family. I have uh, three more brothers, and uh, my father's wife, she is just like a mother to all of us. They treat my sisters and my brother just like we all belong to them. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And like again, only God can do that. And I'm just so grateful to share this story. And I hope I'm saying something to somebody that if you want to find your parent, don't give up. And make the best of it when you do. Because, you know, time is short. And every day... It's a day of thanksgiving for me. I thank the Lord for standing here talking to each of you. And I pray that something is said that you can take with you if by chance you're missing one of your parents. Believe that it is possible for you to meet your parent because all things are possible through Christ. Thank you. short German, so I hope you can see my face. (laughs) And my mother did often say, I don't know where you came from, you're so short. (laughs) My father's side. Oh, yeah. Yes. 
Um, I would like to thank Rosemary, Dina, and the Black Research and Heritage Association for the opportunity to present today. I feel honored to represent my family and to tell this part of our history. In the audience today is my sister Krista over there. Would you stand up please, or don't if you don't want to. <laughs> Krista, write this presentation, clarifying dates, providing suggestions, editing, listen to me again, reread it out loud, and also providing suggestions and reading with my younger sister Pamela. My daughters Karen and Jessica were also quote unquote readers who asked the I don't understand questions needed to help me to clarify information. Karen especially generously shared her time and editing skills. My friend Alcide's guidance on how to present a paper was extremely helpful and they all provided much encouragement, much enthusiasm and a whole lot of that of girls. Public speaking is not what I do for a living so I'm a bit nervous, but I'm also excited to talk with you about my family history and preparing this paper was a challenge. The challenge was to write, to express the viewpoints of my family's experiences because this is the first time I've been able to fully speak about my bicultural, biracial experience without having to hide my heritage and my experience in order to make others feel comfortable. This is a picture of my father when he was little. Isn't he sweet? <laughs> my great-grandmother, who I got my hair from. My parents, Elsa, parents, parents Leslie Littles and Elsa Lindenbeck, were two who lived through World War II, met after the war, married in Germany, moved to the States, and had a family of eight children. The story of my parents' courtship and marriage in Proust World War II Germany is just one of many describing the relationship between a Negro, an American GI, and a German woman and the world they found themselves in. But for us, they were just Mooney and Daddy. They gave us a legacy in the face of obstacles, an example of accepting a person for their personal qualities versus racial background, and a critical eye when it comes to understanding what is happening in the world. And just a definition breakdown. Muti is Muni, Daddy is Daddy. So I'll be using it the way we speak it. The second of six children, my father, Leslie Littles, was born June 30th, 1921, in Jackson, Mississippi, to Jackson Littles and Fanny Holmes. The family farm was part of the original 280 acres purchased by his grandfather, Henderson Littles, in 1869. There his family grew cotton, corn, and sugar cane. When Daddy was 12, his father, his mother, Fanny, died of pneumonia. She was only 37. Daddy, his father, two brothers, farmed the land together for the next four years until his father's death in 1937. Grandfather Jackson, who was 34 years older, and by the way, he also changed his age on every one of his kids' birth certificates, <laughs> was 34 years older than my grandmother and he was 75 when he passed. Within four short years during the Great Depression, Daddy lost and his siblings lost both parents. At 16 years old, in order to do this last harvest, Daddy had to take his uncle to court to get back the animals and the farm equipment that his uncle took after his grand, after grandfather died. Many years later, while doing research, I found the legal documents in the Jackson, Mississippi courthouse showing that he took his uncle to court. Despite the loss of their parents, they brought that harvest in, and they kept the farm until the 1960s. With the death of their father, the youngest siblings, eight, six, and four, went to live with their youngest <coughs> maternal aunt, and the oldest children went to live with their oldest maternal aunt. Several years later, my, my father and his brother Howard migrated north, first to Chicago, which he said was very prejudiced, and Detroit was better. So that's where they ended up, for employment and educational opportunities. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, my father enlisted in the Army. There he is. And my second son looks exactly like him. And shipped out for Europe from Fort Hamilton in December of 1944. And that's in Brooklyn. 
of Fort Hamilton. Daddy arrived in England five days later on the 21st of December 1944, where he and the other troops were parceled out among English families for the Christmas holidays. And he remarked that they were very, very friendly, and he didn't feel any prejudice. They were so warm and accepting. As the war progressed, the Army's position on using Negro pilots, better known as the Tuskegee Airmen, changed. The general shortage of qualified men to work on U.S. Army Air Corps aircraft and to man the airfields was also a pressing need. Transferring to a unit that was requesting men interested in working with aircraft, Daddy was trained and ran a U.S. airfield in Gothenburg, where he also worked on aircraft. And later, that's where he met my mother, Elsa Lindenbeck Felsner. Regarding the end of the war, Daddy said, quote, his unit only knew the war was over when, after a couple of days, they weren't sent out. There was no official military notice to them stating that fighting had stopped. And there was no parades, by the way, when they came back to the United States after the war, like the newsreels showed on TV, unquote. My father said, quote, there was no love or mercy in war, unquote. He also said, war is the most destructive, sinful thing a man can do. That's my observation, unquote. These quotes were thoughts that I recorded in 2008. That's my mom. My mother, Elsa Dorothy Hulda Lindenbeck, was born in Essen, Germany, September 27, 1921, to Otto Ernst and Johanna Lindenbeck. She was the oldest of two children. Her brother, Dita, was six years younger. After completing her education at 16, my mother, working as a hosiery shop owned by a Jewish couple, suddenly and without warning in November of 1938, on the Reich Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass, um, the shop the next morning was taken over by a Nazi soldier. As Germany became a military state, all, employee citi all employable citizens were assigned jobs. My mother was assigned a job in a major factory in Essen. Once Poland was invaded in September 1939 and war was declared, Essen became one of the first industrial cities to be bombed in Germany by the English. And this was because Krupp's munitions was a big factory there. It made the tanks, trains, and munitions. Mutti stated, quote, once the factories were bombed, records for those who worked there were gone, and soldiers could not know if you left the cities, unquote. And she said that being young, and energetic, she got into a train in Essen crowded with young Germans, soldiers, and she went to see if the borders were open to Italy or Switzerland, so possibly her and the family could get out of Germany that way. Both borders were closed. While on the train, when the conductor called out for tickets, the soldiers would hide her in the back of the car by standing in front of her, since it was too packed for the conductor to get to the back of the car. Oma, Opa, Mutti, and Uncle Dita left Essen by walking for six weeks to get away from the bombing. Opa would get angry with Oma for stopping to look at the flowers in the farmer's fields. <laughs> they ended up in Weimar, when my mother and her brother tried to find work and a place to live for the family. Since both my mother and Uncle Dita had good voices, they sought employment in the arts. They eventually studied with Selma von Schneidt, and I don't know anything about her. While in Weimar, my mother met her first husband, Emil Peter Feldsnow, a glider pilot in the American Air Force. There's a theme here. They married in Gothenburg and would have a daughter, Valtrau Dorothea, born in 1945. There she is. As the war was ending in Germany, many soldiers were taking off their uniforms and wearing civilian clothes during their efforts to get back home. And as happens in war, not all soldiers knew that the war was over, and so they kept fighting. Emil Feltzner was killed in such a situation in the schelsberg hilstein area of Germany. He was found injured by a farm family who took care of him. However, he died of his wounds. They buried him in the family cemetery and contacted authorities about his death, and the authorities are notified my mother. The Felsner family has the picture of the cemetery, his headstone, and family members who had taken care of him. 
courtship. World War II ended in the spring of 1945, and the Allies divided Germany into four sections. Many German civilians and tradesmen tried to find work on military bases. My Uncle Dieter was 18 and loved aviation, and as he knew a few words of English by then, he wanted to visit the nearest American military base to look at the planes. And after some coaxing, Mutti and Uncle Dieter traveled to Gothenburg, the nearest U.S. base. During the visit, my mother met the group of men running the airfield, my father being one of the three men. Over a coke, my ma father went out over the other two men for my mother's attention. And that's the two of them together. During their courtship, Mutti experienced a great deal of backlash from Germans for dating an Allied soldier, an American, a Negro man. And like the other German women who had American boyfriends, my mother was harassed by the German police. In fact, she was picked up and put in jail several times. And whenever this occurred, Mooney would get word to Daddy as best she could, often through informal network made up of German women, their American boyfriends, or friends. Daddy received the news he would contact the MPs, milita American military police. And they, in turn, made the German police release Mutti and the other arrested German girlfriends. Although Frater Zeissen was found upon by the Allies, did this not stop Allied soldiers from dating German women after the war, especially my parents? They were determined not only to date, but to get married. I was born in a German hospital July of 1947 in the city of Eschenbach. I would gain my American citizenship through my father. Daddy, <laughs> hair is just the same, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Daddy knew that marrying Mooney would be a challenge, but he was about to find out just how difficult it would be for both of them in the fall of 1947. In order to be cleared for marriage, first Mooney would have to pass a rigorous background check to be certain that she had not been a Nazi and that she was a person of good reputation. <clears throat> Secondly, Daddy had to get the signatures of every offer, officer in the chain of command for his unit all the way up to the Supreme Allied Commander in the American Zone, a total of 75 signatures. Diddy was more than a little skeptical about getting all 75 signatures in triplicate through the military mail and said as much. And so he requested, and his supervisors gave him, the use of a truck for one week to drive from military base to military base until he had all the 75 signatures in triplicate in hand. Meanwhile, my mother had to sign documents giving up her German citizenship. However, she would not receive American citizenship once she married my father. She would be considered an immigrant and she would have to file, when you get a green card, she would have to file a yearly form. The travel document in lieu of passport that my mother was issued February 1947 for her trip to the United States was good for a year for travel to the U.S. only. They were finally married in February of 48, and we would have to leave on the next ship traveling to the United States. At the time, that seemed like no big deal. Despite the logistic challenge and social opticals, ops, you know what I mean, my parents were one of the fortunate few couples that made it through the government red tape. With the work, paperwork completed, finally married, and me in tow, my parents drove to Erlangen, so everybody in, in, in Nuremberg and southern Germany know where I am, to pick up my half-sister, Walter, from her grandparents' home. Mutti thought it was only right to allow the Feltness, Feltness to spend time with Walter before the four of us left Germany for the States. What my mother did not know was that while my parents were getting all the necessary paperwork done to get married, and permission for Walter and Muni to leave Germany. Her in-laws had gotten adoption papers ready for their oldest son to adopt Walter. They, they said they wanted to keep Walter because she was the only child of Emil Peter, who was the youngest child and had died in the war. They simply refused to return Walter to my mother. Later in life, Muni said, quote, she felt like they had tricked her into leaving Walter in Germany. They did not ask her, they just showed her the adoption papers and refused to tell Mutti where they had taken Walter. 
They knew that my mother did not have a lot of time to argue, given that the time restraints on her uh, travel passport. My father said that he could get the military to make them return Valtal to her. Moody's answer to my dad was, quote, since they wanted her so badly that she would not take, she would not take Valtal away from them, unquote. I think she tried to look into the future and thought they, they loved her and would take good care of her. My mother continued to write back and forth to the Felsner family, her mother and sister-in-laws, sharing how her life in the United States was going, the children born, and, how to, and asking how Valtard was doing. However, the Felsters never told Mooney where Valtard was and who she was living with, only that she was doing well. It would not be until after my mother's death in 1990 that we found out what Valtard's married name was and where she lived. Finally, my parents and I left the United States. We set sail on the Liberty ship Bruckner, departing from Bremenhaven, Germany, and arriving a week later at Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, New York. My parents were the only mixed couple out of 500 American German couples on that ship. Once stateside, my father finished out his military service and finally ended up as an escort for Negro soldiers who would be buried in the South. And so the kids came. My sister Dorothy was born in 1948 while my mother and I were living in Detroit. Leslie Jr. was born in 1951. After my father left the service, he bought a 320 acre farm located in White Cloud, Michigan. He farmed while also working in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And during this time, my brother Udo was born in 1952. Cursed in 1954, sorry. Old's like 1956. <laughs> <laughs> and we moved to Guyana Rapids, Michigan in 1957 so that my father could find better employment. My brother, Dita, was born in 58, and my sister, Pamela, was born in 1960. In the following years, my father had many careers, several being working on the new interstate highways that came in the early 60s for the Arkadine Corporation, one of the, on the early space shuttle, with the Franklin Complex, a pilot program that was started in Grand Rapids, Michigan under Johnson's Great Society programs. My mother went on to gain her citizenship, earn her GED, and work in the VA hospital in Grand Rapids where she retired in 1986. In May of 1981, as a present to our mother, all, our children, all of her children bought her a ticket for a visit to Germany. I accompanied her. This was her first trip back to Germany since 1948. We flew into the Frankfurt airport and rented a car. Needless to say, the Autobahn is an experience, <laughs> not to be missed. While Diagon in a strict shift, I'll never do that again. <laughs> the first place we dove to was Rotenburg up to Tauba, where Dora Felsner lived. My mother got on the payphone and called Dora Felsner, who shared with her that Valtraut was married and doing fine. She would not tell Mutti her married name or where she was living. We then traveled to her hometown of Essen, which is in northern Germany around Dusseldorf, where we visited her brother Dieter and Mutti's cousins. Sadly, by this time, my grandparents had passed away. My father often told a story when I visited Oma and Opa when I was little. My grandfather would carry me around as if I was made of gold, feeding me chocolate until my face was smeared in it. It was exhilarating for me to see and spend time with my Uncle Dita again. He was a sweet man. He was pleased to see me again and held me in his lap as if I was still the toddler he last saw in 1948. And in actuality, I was 34, married, and had four kids. <laughs> I so enjoyed visiting my family in Germany. The sound of people speaking German made me feel good, as if I were home. And for the first time, I then realized that I understood and used English as a native speaker, but it is German that makes me feel at home. It took Muni about three days before she could express herself fluently in German again. And as Muni's German came back to her, so did slang terms from the 1940s. <laughs> And her, husband, her cousins had a good laugh about that. I got a headache trying to understand all the German being spoken and just gave up after a while. 
I didn't know every word to feel the warmth and the joy we all felt. Moni continued writing Dora Felsner over the years, and in 1989, she asked me to write a short letter to her. This letter would play a pivotal role in the family reunion. I wrote a letter in November of 1989, as best I could with my beginning German. Moni did not leave a reply until late March of 1990, which, unfortunately, was just three weeks too late. Moti died on March 11th, 1990. The reason for Doris Felsner's delayed reply, unknown to Mutti, was that she was going blind and no longer could read her mail. Valtard was taking care of her, and Valtard discovered my letter in her mail. My sister decided that she would answer the letter, but first she discussed the pros and the cons of answering it with her husband and children. She decided to write Mutti a long letter introducing herself. She told Mutti about her life and her family. I replied to her letter and had the sad duty to tell her that after all these years and now finding her, Moody was no longer with us. We began writing each other, and after five years in 1995, Dita and I visited Valtraud and her family in Erlangen. It was a wonderful feeling to meet my sister, to visit her and listen as she told us how her life went after Moody, Daddy, and I went to the United States. She was not adopted, as had been promised, nor had her grandparents or aunt told her where Muti lived or her married name. We shared the American side of the family story. We compared our stories and how things might have been if she had come to the United States with us. We kept in contact over the years, and I visited her in 96 and 97 and Valtraud visited us in the States in 1998 with her two daughters, <clears throat> Yael and Nicole. She saw Daddy for the first time since she was a little girl in Germany. <clears throat> her memory of Daddy was that he wore a uniform, but most importantly, quote, he gave her candy on a stick, unquote. <laughs> she said she does not remember Mutti at all. Daddy always called her daughter and wanted to know when we would hear any news of her, and Valtraud would write daddy letters. Krista, Dorothy, and I visited Valtraud in 1999, just one picture, and daddy and other families would visit in 2003, and that was his first visit back to Germany since 1948. I shared with Valtraud that I will be telling our family story at this conference, I provided her with a basic outline, and she said, I did not know how Mutti and Daddy had met, and thank you for sharing the story. Daddy passed, lived to be 100, uh, what is it, 91 and a half years old, dying on March 10th, 2013. We, their children, like to think that after fighting to stay with us for so long, Mutti came to Daddy and said, quote, Leslie, that's enough. I think it is time to go now. They both passed on the second Sunday in March, 23 years apart. Conclusion, I think my family is unique in that my father managed the military system in 1946 and 48 in Germany while being a Negro under the command of a white Southerner, as was the custom in those times. He managed to marry his German sweetheart while still in Germany, bring home his wife and his child, Wa, and return to the States, adopted in the same port that he left in 44. My mother survived the war and afterwards adopted to a new country, language, and customs to begin life with her family in the United States. In fact, while my father was away in training on escort duty, she learned to speak, read, and write English. This she accomplished without schooling, but with the use of the German-English dictionary and a TV my dad bought before he left to go to Kiesler Base. While she learned English, my sister and I also learned English. Moody told us that she started out with English words she could use while grocery shopping. She also said that she would go alone to the shops since my dad's younger brother, Howard, was uncomfortable being seen walking with a German woman when we lived in Detroit. Uncle Howard would often tell the story while laughing, 
of how Dorothy and I, and that's Pepper too, I spoke with a German, thick German accent. He did not tell us how our accent was accepted, but I often guess that it took a few people by surprise. <laughs> and so, Mochi and Daddy, thank you for listening and allowing me to share our story. I think he has to work the magic to get out of this. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave it. No, no, sir. So would you please join me in thanking these ladies again for opening up our conference and convention. Those of you who saw me yesterday and today or who uh, are connected with me via Facebook know how excited I've been. And I can share with you that that hasn't changed. <laughs> I don't know if I'm even more or could even be more excited. I really, truly appreciate your sharing your very, very personal stories with me. Um, I will carry them with me as gifts, uh, gifts to our organization, to our community, and to our collective history. Thank you. Do we have a minute for questions if there's Anyone who would like to direct a question at any one of the ladies? I'm working on one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, born between two worlds. Any others? Yes. Just have a question to Lita. Yeah. When you were working on your story, and you said several family members joined in, in reading, making suggestions. Did the conversation take place about aspects of your memory, of your experiences that you hadn't, through the questions, that you had not really? You know who was best to bring that up for me was my children, Karen and Jessica, because that was the hardest thing for me, is to be objective enough to, to, to provide enough information because to me it's in my head or it's a story my mother told and so that helped flush a lot of that out for me and then with Krista she would always like any family you don't have to go with family history all the family members hold a part of it and you have to get together with the pieces she would tell me things like oh I didn't know that she did that to me you know that kind of <laughs> that kind of situation and so it helped build the closeness and the more complex things. Any other questions? Yes. I have a quick question about the language, German. Was it spoken at home, that, for example, with your sisters that, or your siblings? Did they speak German? Did your mom mm -hmm. speak German at home? Yeah. yeah, she spoke German at home. Do you know it took me almost 30 years to get rid of calling everything shank and <laughs> stuff like that? And my husband couldn't understand. He said, would you quit talking with the German? At home, we, you know, halls left and whatever. Um, it, it, that's that's the language in the house that you don't hear that you don't hear that only somebody coming in will tell you that it's that mm -hmm. I think like I s tried to convey German was my first language mm -hmm. English is my second and I think as she was learning because I know and I don't know if you did it too I know I did it when my mother would get stuck on an English word you're working with her, you know <laughs> and you would supply that that English word but she was she was very good with the English she used to correct her homework Mm -hmm. Any others? So then I will thank you again, and I guess I'll turn the podium over to Sarah Lennox. Is it time? Or take a break? Okay, good. Okay. And we'll see you in a little bit.